Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, 4 degrees 12 minutes south, 171 degrees 35 minutes west. Wind light, sky fair. Remarks, left Hull Island, Phoenix Group, after involvement in tribal beliefs. Reason for involvement, red beard and the bag of pearls. It was a brilliant, sun-washed afternoon that the puff of cumulus on the horizon ahead slowly raised to show beneath it an indistinct smudge. It darkened as we moved toward it, took on a definite palm-tufted outline, and finally materialized as the four-mile length of Hull Island. Its flat silhouette is broken at its western end by a grove of 80-foot palms, and it's set against the backdrop of water and sky and never-ending summer. Gallagher approached me at the wheel as we stood in toward our passage. It was resplendent in a newly grown burning red beard that shone in the sunlight. Hey, Barbarossa, huh? if you can make yourself heard through that eight bell shadow, douse the sails. We'll go in under power. Aye, aye, sir, and your jealousy does not throw me. <laughs> Stand by to take it in full on sail. All two up, my man. <laughs> You'll be turning right for something. We slipped through the passage into the quiet lagoon water and headed toward the small pier that served the copra station of Harris Fenwick, the man who was to receive the cargo of supplies we had aboard. The Scarlet Queen had company in the unkempt schooner Ransom from Honolulu that was anchored just off the pier. We dropped our hook next to her, and in the quiet after we were secure, I heard for the first time the muffled throb of drums from the island. Then I noticed that the man who walked down the pier toward us carried a rifle. I'm glad you finally got here, Captain Carney. Are you Fenric? No. He's up in the cottage. I'm Ray Librado, captain of the schooner. What are the drums? The natives are stored up. Better leave your crew aboard, Captain. But we need you ashore. We think they will attack tonight. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to sail the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. This is my mate, Mr. Gallagher, Captain Labrado. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Quite a beard you got, Redhead. Yeah, it's not bad for a start. What's the story, Captain? What's bothering the natives? First, I uh, I think you better give me your gun. You what? what kind of a move is that? I think it's better I took over command here. Fenric, he isn't worth anything. I think it's better if I have all the guns so nobody don't do any shooting until I want them to. Well, how do you like that? You got the wrong men, Labrado. We'll sweat this out on the ship on the other side of the reef. Come on, Red. Yeah. Wait a minute. Use your heads. I need you on this island. You stay here. Where else? Here we go, Skipper. Hold it, Red. What's up, Ray? These guys think I'm kidding. Take their guns. What is this? Hold it, Red. Don't try nothing now, either one of you. You're all LeBron. Now. Don't have to be tough. Just so it's my way. Is that rifle? What else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess that does it, Ray. Uh, let's be friends now, huh? This is my mate, Morel. We got a thing to do here. Let's pull together, huh? Yeah, I'm not kicking. I like to be shoved around like this. You make friends fast, you guys. Maybe this don't mean a thing, but I got to know you're all right when I talk to you. Come on. We go up to the cottage. There were two more men in the main room of the cottage we entered. One who ignored us as we came in wore seaman's clothes and a belted automatic. The other, sitting stiffly in a wicker chair, I took for Harris Fenrick. A slight graying man with a purplish bruise covering the left side of his face from temple to chin. And a look for Labrado that mixed fear and hate. Sit down. This is Thorpe from my crew. And he's Fenrick. <laughs> he don't talk much. 
With that face, he doesn't have to. I'll talk when it's the time. Shut comes. up. You go what's coming to him. I came in here without food stores or fuel for my auxiliary. This guy turned me down when I want to buy it from him. These Phoenix Islanders haven't been at war for 50 years. What's got him riled up? <laughs> These. Oh, the pearls? That's right. Plenty of them. They'll go $40,000 on skin. I won't fight you for them. Give me a match. Light your own. Burrell. Yeah. Match. Yeah, boy. Now, let's get one thing settled between you and me and uh, Curly Locks with the fire whiskers yeah, there. Don't blow that smoke in my face, you Guys dumb... like us don't come down to these islands for the weather. You're carrying cargo for money. I'm pearling for money. We uh, see eye to eye on that now. Hmm? Yeah, I think I can figure that one out. I got these pearls just like every other pearl in the business. I anchor over the bed. I got them in the Gilberts on a shelf between Beiru and Nicaragua. It's simple enough, huh? I don't care where you got them. What are you driving at? That bed, the Gilbert Tees thing, nobody should dive there. It's sacred. They bury their warriors there for, I don't know, maybe four or five hundred years, maybe more, I don't know. You mean these are Gilbert Tees out here with the drum? They follow you all the way over here? That's right. More of them come every day. The market wants these pearls. I should throw them back just because these Kanakas get some crazy ideas? When you break a taboo, you're asking for trouble. You asked for it, now you got it. That's all right. I got the pearls, too. <laughs> I'll fix these boys. They bought me last night when I was there. Take off my native crew, cut my sails, and then my running rigging. Throw the lines in blocks over the side. It's going to don't sail for a long time. I come all the way here two days ago on my engine. And this Fenric won't help me get repaired so I can get out of here. Because I'd ruin everything I built here if I did. My workers are Gilbertese, too. He wanted to force them on the crew. Fenric. You ain't talking, remember? Now, Carney... You got any extra gear and canvas I could buy from you? No. None that I can spare. Hmm. Too bad you say that. I hope you like shooting, Kanaka. I don't. Especially when it's your kind of fight. You'll get plenty of chance. As far as they're concerned, you're fighting on my side, no matter what you do. They saw you come in. They got it all figured out how you came to help me get away. This is your fight, too, now. You'll find out what I mean. It didn't take long to find out. The sun dropped into the west, and soon after half its circle had sunk into the horizon, Labrado's crewman, Burrell, standing at the window... Hey, Labrado! ...called out the warning. They're moving out there. Coming this way. A whole gang of them. All right. Back. We go meet them outside. Bring a rifle, Thorpe. Burrell, you watch Redbeard. Okay. Labrado's automatic pushed Fenric and me out the door and off the veranda. There must have been a hundred or more trickling toward us through the neat rows of palms. We're wearing full tribal gear and paint, carrying war clubs and short spears. There wasn't a long-range weapon in the crowd. They stopped at the edge of the grove. A tall, erect native stepped to the front and raised his hand to us. His headdress was a little higher, his paint a little gaudier. And he was weaponless. What? So I and I why? What do you say, Henrik? The truth I want. He says that he has seen the spirit omen, and he comes in peace. He's a liar. What was that? He says the spirit omen will protect him. He will walk into our house with the spirit omen at his side. He will return a victor to his island, Beiru, where the spirit omen once lived. He's coming, Lebrado. Let him come. Give him five steps more and then show them we mean business. Hey, wait a minute. No. Go ahead, Thorpe. Brother, don't let him shoot. Go ahead, Thorpe. Get that native. You stupid. No. You, you lunkheads. You shot that chief. Thorpe, watch it. Here comes another one. That crazy fool is just going to pick up the chief. They're going away. What more do you want? Yeah. Well, Carney, how do you like the way we fight now? That's great. You and these smoke-crazy hands of yours have got real guts. That was the tough assignment, that native who didn't even have a slingshot. Come on, we go inside and talk. Or else, you and Thor bring Curly Locks in. We'll bring him. Come on, Connie, move ahead. You too, Henrik, inside. (laughs) 
Take that chair there, Carney. Don't bother being nice. I like you better the other way. What's the matter, Carney? We're in this together, huh? Together? Sure. It's going to be tough from now on since uh, we killed that chief. They waste a few Kanakas and use up our ammunition. They wait long enough, they starve us out. Lazy monkeys, they get plenty of time. I think we better get off of this island, don't you? We... Oh, yeah, you mean you and Burrell and Thorpe. We all go together on my ship, huh? Sure. You say you don't have any spare gear or canvas. And anyway, I don't think we got time now to make repairs on my ship. I'll pay our passage to Borneo and you don't lose Why don't anything. you stop? I kicked myself from here to Sydney before I get sucked into a deal like that. That's enough, I tied on as a galley slave to that dead chief's survivors before I'd help you get out of here on my ship. All right, Tony, you keep begging. What are you, you lay off. I'm going to catch you without that automatic before this is over. All right, Red. I'd rather be slugged than talked to by this louse. Maybe you get both, Connie. You and your mate, too. I gave you a chance. I'm through trying to make sense with you. Hey, Lebrado. Yeah, hey, what have you got? Getting dark out there. But it looks like the grove out in front's crawling with Kanakas. So if you go stand guard at the door, I'll watch these guys. Move over there, Fenric. You too, Connie, over by your mate. It's them, all right. Lebrado, they're coming out of the grove. Then open up, fools, if you got targets, fire. Slow them up. When they get too close, we leave from the back window. If any of them back there, we can shoot our way through. We leave these three here for them. They're too close, LeBron. They won't stop. Keep firing. Uh, it's no use. Come on. Let's not wait any longer. We go out the north rim. They can have these three in payment for their chief. <laughs> After they'd gone through the window, we just had time to get to our feet before the flood of natives rolled into the cottage. We backed to the wall, but the swarm of brown bodies smothered us like soldier ants covering the carcass of a mouse. I was pulled from the wall and lost Gallagher and Fenric. Then I was looking into a brown vermilion dabbed face. I caught the flash of a polished war club over my head and saw the lips in front of me pull away from a set of blackened teeth. And then I seemed to explode upward to meet the descending club. The first thing that came back to me was the difference in sound. It was raining. I got my eyes open. The room swam into focus. I stumbled to my feet. One chair had been knocked over. Beyond it on the floor lay Harris Fenrick. When I looked around, I couldn't find Red. He was gone. Red? Red! Red! What? Uh, Fenric? Uh, Fenric, wait a minute. I'll get some water. Uh, All right. Come on, Fenric. Okay, come on, Connie. You're all right. Yeah, come on, Fenric. Get yourself together. My head can't... Yeah, I know it's bad. I'm doing the best I can. Fenric, listen. Gallagher is gone. Gallagher? The natives took him. They took him? Do you understand me? Yeah, yes, Captain. Are you sure they took him? What else? They caught us here. Now he's gone. Oh, I couldn't have been Labrado or the others. You mean they took him to pay for their chief? That is their custom, Captain Connie. The spirit of one of the enemy who dies while looking at the dead chief will be the slave of the Gilbertese spirit in their hereafter. Never mind all that. How much time have I got? A few hours, perhaps. Where Captain. are they? Captain, I know the hopelessness of anything you would attempt. You yourself would be killed. I'm afraid I must refuse to answer any more of your questions. Where are they? I'm sorry, Captain. But you sent me to my death. But I'll make them understand that he's the wrong man. You couldn't. Any man from the enemy village. We're all enemies since Labrador was among us. Come on, Fenric, before I shake it out of you. Where would they take us? I'm sorry, I'm Captain. Where are you, Connie? Use your head. Labrador. After all this, you come back to do more. Sure. Sure I come back. Why not? With the same forty-five, in case Carney gets too brave. Have it ready, Labrador. When you need it, you're going to need it in a hurry. It is ready. Why don't you wake up, Carney? Your mate is gone with the Kanakas. What can you do? Use your head. Go with me to your ship now so we can get off this island. Drop it. I pay your passage in advance. You're just making me sick. Drop it. Get sore, pull the trigger, do something, but quit trying to sell me that deal. All right. You stay on the island, then. With you, it would be easy. But you think we can't leave on your ship without you? We handled crews like that before. We'll make it all right. You might have that for a few days. It's a good try, Connie. I promise you that. 
Now that you give me your ship, I tell you where the Kanakas take your mate. Labrador, why don't you just shoot him? You know what you're doing to him by telling him. Sure, I know. <laughs> I fix it so the captain can bend over three sharp bamboo stakes. Two for the belly and one for the heart. While a big Kanaka, he pushes him down from behind. Abrado. Go through the grove, Carney. South of there, you'll find a scrub forest. After you go through 300 yards, you look low underneath. Maybe see their fire. Maybe you get there in time to see how the three stakes look in your mate. You happy now? Yeah, and I don't want to spoil it by forgetting you got that gun. Get out of here, Labrado. I can't stay away from you. Get out of here, Labrado. Sure, Carney. It don't make me sad to get out of here. Captain Carney. It's all right, Fenwick. But your ship, why not go with him and try to save at least that? He's ruined what I've built. And now for a hopeless search, you let him put an end to what you have. That's enough, Fenwick. Maybe you're right. Maybe I should have gone. But I couldn't. Not yet. I followed the beach. I walked the 200 yards. Then started dropping to the ground every 10 feet or so to look under the heavy foliage for a flicker of flame. I covered half of the next 100. I squatted low for a few minutes, my soaked clothes sticking coolly to my body. The movement of a figure on the beach ahead caught my eye. All my attention focused on it. Not for long, but long enough to dull me to the movement behind me. It was a short rush. I half turned to meet one of them. The other one stayed behind me and a loop settled around my throat. And... I... I struggled until I was blinded by the flashes in my eyes. The noose relaxed as soon as I stopped. The hand in my back pushed me in the direction the native behind me wanted me to go. I stumbled ahead along an unseen passage through the scrub. I entered the uneven circle of light spreading from a number of fires fighting against the rain. I looked up at a wall of stony, silent faces. And my natives pulled me to a halt. I made myself look at the ground. Forced my eyes to stay on a triangle of stiletto-sharp stakes that gleam wetly in the firelight. Yeah, my eyes all up. My guard took my shoulder. The noose slipped off, then he turned me away from the stake. Pushed me forward toward the wall of natives. An aisle split the crowd. I was guided through it. I made the first six feet on the other side, then I stopped. The fire on this side was bigger. The flames leaping cheerfully, higher than my head, forming a curtain that I could see vaguely through. Only vaguely, and I still didn't believe what I thought I saw. Yeah! I moved around the fire. And I had to believe it because I heard it. Well, then, no! This is not the killer of the chief. Why not? Gallagher. Not impaled on stakes, but seated on a chair of sorts, his bright red beard glowing in the firelight, and a shelter of palm leaves protecting him from the rain the rest of us stood in. He looked at me coolly, then gestured idly with two fingers on his right hand. Have the white man sent to me. Tell them I speak to the white man. Then we find the killer of their chief. Maori! What? You are fake! Tell it! Tell it! Tell it! Tell it! Don't let out you know me. I'm a big gun around here. And if I like you, I might save your life. I was stumbling around here figuring maybe I'd save yours. What the devil's going on? My beard and my color is fine. Yeah. They saw me come ashore. And then they dragged me out of that cottage and made a big shot out of me before I could congratulate myself. <laughs> they got a legend that a guy with a beard and hair like I'm sporting floated into Beiru Island in the Gilberts three or four hundred years ago. And he turned into quite a leading light. They think I'm him. Come back to save their pearls. Think you'll make it? I hope so. Because if I don't... <laughs> That's why I had them out there waiting for you. I knew you'd get on this trail sometime. Ren, Labrado yeah. and his hands were on their way to take over the Queen when I left. The Queen? What's the matter with you, Skipper? How'd you let him get away with they that? They had all the artillery. I didn't even have you. Oh, yeah. I don't think they'll risk the reef with this rain-cutting visibility. But we better take a stab at it quick. Catch them while they're at anchor. Yeah. Can you get some helpers? <laughs> Can I? All I gotta do is wag this beard. How many do you want? Fifty, a hundred, or the whole blasted pack? Twenty of the best swimmers. <laughs> That's great, but being what I am, I'll have to outswim them. Or admit that I'm human. <laughs> Watch my beard, Skip. I'll show you how it's done. Stand by! Tell them this. I demand twenty swimmers. 
They must be strong and silent and filled with fire. When they are ready, we will go and get the pearls, the one who took them from the burial bed, and the two killers of their chief, Matangi. Hey, you're all right, Red. <laughs> you got that immortal attack. <laughs> this is the life for you. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But that other Joe, he married eight wives. You, you should see what I've been through dodging that, that honor. Well, you tell him you've got a scarlet queen that just sets off your beard. That's woman enough for you. Believe me, Skipper, I'll be glad to get her back. An hour later, Gallagher and I had led our 20 natives to the edge of the lagoon, a safe distance away from the pier, and stripped down to dungarees. We slipped into the water stroked silently with our arms submerged, with only our heads breaking the surface. We reached the queen, rested on the port side. We found both Thorpe and Burrell standing watch on deck. According to plan, I submerged, swam under the keel. Came up on the starboard side, waited there for the disturbance that was to take them to port so I could board. I didn't hear the sound, but I saw Thorpe's head lift and swing toward it. I was halfway over the rail by the time they started to move. And I was behind them as they reached the rail. I dropped to the deck and lifted their feet first. Thorpe, and then Burrell. They were fished out by waiting brown arms that quieted their struggling and started towing them to shore. Gallagher came aboard. We didn't wait for LeBron. Come on, Skipper. We went after him. He was sitting on the edge of my bunk, idly picking an untrimmed thumbnail. When he saw us, his mouth dropped open. He lunged to his feet and his hand streaked toward the automatic in his waist. Hey, what the devil? Without the gun this time, LeBron. Oh, no. I take his gun right off, take him. Hey, what do you think you're doing, Carl? I don't know what to do without that automatic in your fist. Do you, LeBron? You don't like it when you're unarmed like that native chief. Oh, Ernie. I don't think you knew what else to do with a guy who had enough guts to walk up to you and your two riflemen. You don't understand guts, do you? Gives you to death when you see them in somebody else. Oh, that's enough. Not quite. It. All right, now get up. All right, I got him. What's this? He fell out of his shirt. Uh, That's the pearls, Randy. You bring them. We'll give both the pearls and Labrado to our friends. Honey, don't let those baby fools get me. Shut up, Labrado. Please, please, Tommy, don't. Don't let them get me. All right, Gallagher. Be the big chief. Hand the pearls over to your loyal subjects. (laughs) Right, Skipper? Hey, you! Here! Ah! Tommy! What are you going to do? Hey, down there! No, Tommy! Your mighty red god has another... The rain let up, and through a rift in the clouds, the moon shot a spotlight that shone on a triangle of palms ashore. They gleamed wetly in the silver light. And they reminded me of the triangle of glistening stiletto-sharp stakes that were now waiting for Labrado. I went in to clean myself up before I hit the sack. By 1.30 the next day, we discharged Fenrick's cargo and left Hull Island basking in the sun peacefully once more, richer for the unkempt schooner Ransom from Honolulu. With the white curl of surf on coral dropping astern, I cut the motor, and Red roared the crew into action. Inside, to make sail! It was a meek equatorial breeze that flowed in on our starboard quarter, but the crewmen jumped to their stations as though it was the wind they'd waited for all their lives. It was a holiday wind that we'd ride to Christmas, no snow or holly wreaths, no sleigh bells or shopping lists. But we'd be one up on the world. We'd celebrate the holiday on Christmas Island. The mainsail blossomed into the air. The jib. Then the mizzen swung across my head and its expanse went to work. The Scarlet Queen, unimpressed by the meager wind she was getting, settled lazily on her course and nestled into the long blue-green swells that stretched endlessly ahead. Hey, Skipper, I got something to show you. How are you, old mighty bearded one, pride of the Gilbert <laughs> Islands? Yeah, you, you think it's a gag, huh? Yeah, yeah, look at here, look. The Pacific Islands Handbook. Page one, two, go, go ahead, go ahead, read, read, right. look, look at that. The Spanish explorer <laughs> Mendana was in these waters in 1567, yeah. 
And it's believed that he may have cited the Gilbert group. <laughs> That's my outfit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, strong native tradition has it that between 1550 and 1600, a man with white skin, red hair, and red beard came ashore at the island of Beiru, Gilbert, in a boat like a box in a famished condition. Yes. Yeah. He recovered, took as wives the eight sisters of a local chief, oh, and had 23 children whose descendants are now scattered throughout 14 of the 16 Gilbert Islands. He may have come from Mendonca's ship. <laughs> How do you like that? It's right there for anybody to read. Oh, Red, it's a great beard, but with yeah. the name Gallagher, it somehow doesn't point back to a Spanish explorer. Yeah, yeah well... <laughs> Well, funnier things have happened, and besides, it worked, didn't it? We got out of there. With your loyal subject pushing eight wives at you, you had to get out. <laughs> How'd you defend yourself, Red? Just like you said. I told him I had a scarlet queen that just fit off my beard. <laughs> Here, Skipper, to the queen. Yeah, after what she got you out of, to the queen. <laughs> after you, mate. After you. Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Wind light, sky fair with cumulus on eastern horizon. Sea, calm with low swell. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, master. of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facility.